This morning for our service, you, we have a special treat, and that is that the message today is going to be delivered by my wife, Linda. You might be interested in knowing it was uh, July 3rd, 1971, that we got married. There's a picture of us uh, having a uh, party, and uh, this coming July 3rd, we're going to be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary. But uh, I know you are in for a great treat, so Linda... Would you come and share the word of God with the folks? Let me pray for you. Lord, I pray for Linda as she shares this morning that the message she gives will minister to the hearts and lives of everyone who's watching. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. I want to begin by saying a very happy Mother's Day. It's great that you have joined to us today. And uh, we want to celebrate motherhood. I came across something in, uh, on the internet, and it just really embodied everything that I wanted to say today. And so I'm going to read it to you. <clears throat> to those who have given birth, we celebrate with you. To those who have lost a child, we mourn with you. To those who are in the trenches with little ones every day and wear the badge of food stains, we appreciate you. To those who experience loss through miscarriage, failed abuse, or running away, we mourn with you. To those who walk the hard path of infertility, fraught with pokes and prods, and tears and disappointment, we walk with you. Forgive us when we say foolish things. We don't mean to make this any harder than it is. To those who are foster moms, mentor moms, and spiritual moms, we need you. To those who have a warm and close relationship with your children, we rejoice with you. To those who have disappointment, heartache, and distance with their children, we sit with you. To those who lost their mothers this year, we grieve with you. To those ex who experienced abuse at the hands of your mother, we hurt with you. To those who live through driving tests, medical tests, and the overall testing of motherhood, we are better for having you in our midst. To those who have aborted children, we remember them and you on this day. To those who are single and long to be married and have, <clears throat> pardon me, and uh, have uh, and mothering your own children, we mourn that life has not yet turned out the way you longed for it to be. <clears throat> to those who step-parent, we walk with you on these sometimes complex paths. To those who place children up for adoption, we commend you for your selflessness, and we remember how you hold that child in your heart. And to those who are pregnant with new life, both expected and surprising, we anticipate with you. This Mother's Day, we walk with you. Mothering is not for the faint of heart, and we have real warriors in our midst. We celebrate you. So happy Mother's Day to you all. As many of you know that uh, before I retired, I worked with women. I was the director of the Women's Department for the Baptist General Conference of Canada, and I had the opportunity to travel across Canada, and I met some pretty amazing women, and I formed some really wonderful friendships. And as I look back over the conversations that I had with these women, I would often hear a longing in their words to feel this deep sense of being okay with who they were. I'd hear statements like, I'm not sure if I'm good enough for whatever. Or sometimes I feel kind of invisible. Or I wish I could be more like someone else. Or I don't think I'm qualified to do this. And it seems that there was this general uncomfortableness with who they were. There was this constant niggling that sense that they should be more, more of something or someone. There was an article in Christianity Today that stated, low self-esteem has become the number one issue plaguing Christian women. 
And Jen Wilkins writes, how many times have I attended a women's event where the message centered on the fact that I am a treasure and my life has purpose. So when my body image is poor or I am feeling inadequate and unimportant or undervalued, I just need to remind myself that I am fearfully and wonderfully made. But somehow that message is not sticking to our ribs very well. We go home buoyed up for a short time and then find ourselves slipping into the old habits of feeling inadequate physically, emotionally, intellectually, and any other way. Today, I thought it might be a good day to address this very issue, the worth of a person. <clears throat> now, I, ha I want to say right from the get-go that those of you who are not mothers, this is not your get-out-of-jail-free card because I believe that at some point, everyone, all of us, struggle with this very issue. It, it's not a gender issue, it's a human issue. It's a question that everyone has asked or is asking or will ask at some point. Am I worthwhile? Do I matter? Do I have value? Is, is my purpose in life a valid one? Am I contributing in any way? Am I important at all in any way? Well, I think in order to address this, we need to rewind and we need to go back to the beginning of us, back to our creation. And I want to show you a video that made a profound impact on me when I first watched it. It's by a man, uh, his name is Louis Giglio. He's a, a speaker down in the United States and he is doing this presentation entitled um, Fearfully and Wonderfully Made. And I encourage you to watch it because I'm sure it will have a profound impact on you as well. But I'll tell you the miracle of tonight is, is crazy and crazier to me than the size of any star. Is that though we are but a vapor, you and me, and tiny and frail, we are marked by majesty and we have been created in the very image of the God who breathes out the stars and put the universe into place. You and I are fashioned and formed and ordained by the God of all creation. We are fearfully and wonderfully made, you and I. You are somebody incredibly special. Let me just dial back to the beginning, and I, I know you know this already, but in the very, very beginning, here's how you happened, okay? One cell from your mom found one cell from your dad. Now, there's more involved in that than that, but that's enough for us right now. And by the way, we should applaud the one cell from your dad because that one cell did a pretty heroic thing to be the one cell in the story that we're talking about tonight. One cell from your mom met up with one cell from your dad, each one carrying 23 chromosomes. The one from your mom was carrying half of her DNA. The one from your dad was carrying half of his DNA. And those two cells met and merged into one single cell. And when they did, those chromosomes matched and they began to form together a brand new DNA code using four characters, four nucleotides, they begin to write out what we have now discovered is the three billion character description of who you are written in the language of God. They wrote out your DNA, your human genome of three billion characters made up of those four simple nucleotides. And when they did, they described who God had ordained you to be. In that one little simple cell. Scientists say if you took the DNA out of that one little cell and stretched it out, that DNA would be six feet long. Three billion characters stretched out to six feet long. So amazing that if I were to read your DNA, reading one character per second, night and day, it would take me 96 years just to read the description of you. And when they formed together, they wrote out and painted a picture which had never been written before in the history of humankind. And then that cell did the unthinkable. It set out to build that model from one cell. 
I'm telling you, you are a miracle sitting in this building tonight. And you have come a long, long way. I mean, here you are. This may not be in the family photo album, but here you are at three days old. Sixteen cells of you. You say, what in the world is that? It's a 16-cell human embryo on the tip of a safety pin at incredible magnification. So by now, that one cell had turned into 16 cells on its way to making the 75 trillion cells that make up your body tonight. Every one of those 75 trillion cells containing that six feet of the three billion character DNA code that's you. There's so much DNA in your body, by the way. If you stretched it all end to end, there'd be enough DNA to go to the moon and back inside your body. 178,000 times. That's how amazing God has made you to be. 75 trillion cells in your body. And when I told you that, 50,000 of those cells died and were replaced by brand new cells when I told you that. And then just now, 50,000 more cells died and were replaced by brand new cells. It's happening every three seconds, day and night, all the days of your existence. And you wonder why you're tired all the time. I'll tell you, you're doing some amazing stuff night and day. We're miracles, you and me. I love the way Augustine said it. One of the great fathers of the church and of the faith. He just nailed it when he said it like this. Men go abroad to wonder at the height of mountains, the huge waves of the sea, the long course of rivers, the vast compass of the ocean, the circular motion of the stars, but they pass by themselves and they don't even notice. In the womb, miracles happening every moment. Here you are at five months in the womb. You remember those days, those were the good old days. <laughs> and just miracles happening every second. Let me tell you about one. Million optic nerve endings left the optic nerve center of your brain in the womb, headed for a million optic nerves that had left your eye. And they had to meet and match their exact partner, one million looking for one million. And when they found their exact partner out of a million and matched up together, in that instant you had sight. And anyone would tell you that to this moment, the most technologically advanced thing on planet Earth is your eye. Oh, but it didn't do you any good because when that moment happened, you just had one piece of skin completely covering your eyeball. But as I read in one textbook, miraculously and mysteriously at about the sixth month, a little cutting device appeared and it cut perfectly that piece of skin. And you had eyelids for the very first time in your mother's womb. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. And the God of the heavens is the one who fashioned you together. And he knows your name tonight. And he knows every single thing there is to know about you and he's made you a promise that for those who trust in him he will literally hold them in his hand and carry them all the days of their life Psalm 139 14 I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. We need to establish a truth, a truth that you can push deep down into your very soul. A truth is something that you cling to, even at times when you're not feeling, the emotions are denying things. You go deep into your soul and find the truth. And this 
is the truth I want you to understand, that you are the thoughtful, intentional, perfect work of a master creator. You are just the way he wants, that, just the way he planned you to be. You are the person that he knew he wanted to exist in this time and in this place in history. And so he went about creating you and knitting you together in your mother's womb. Psalm 139 says, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. Have you ever wondered why God bothered creating humans? I mean, from the sounds of Genesis chapter 1, he did a very good job creating the world. The sun, the moon, the stars, the plants, the bodies of water, the animals. When I go to nature and look around, I think, wow, this, this is good. Why did he have to continue on and create human beings? Could he not have just been satisfied with nature? But we read in Genesis uh, chapter 1, verse 26, that God said, let us make human beings in our image to be like us. And in verse 27, so God created human beings in his image. In the image of God, he created female, male and female. He created them. But why? Why do you think God wanted human beings? Well, perhaps there is a clue given to us in the very last book of the Bible. If we turn to Revelation chapter 4, we, verse 11, we read, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. Now, I know that some translations will say that by your will they are and were created, which perhaps is the more accurate translation from the Greek, but I think the concept is the same, no matter which translation you use, that we have been created by God because he found pleasure in doing that, and he wanted us. It was his will. He chose the creation of us. He chose our existence. That was his desire. I think the other reason that he created human beings is because he wanted to have a relationship with us. You need to understand that your basic purpose in life is to have a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. But of course, if we go back to Genesis chapter, or the beginning of Genesis, we realize that sin came into the world and that relationship between man and God was destroyed by sin. But God wanted that relationship so badly that he sent his one, his only son, to earth to die for us so that the shed blood of Jesus could cleanse the sin that separates us from him. And now we can come to him and have a relationship simply by confessing that sin and asking Jesus to forgive us. And we have that, that relationship with God that he intended right from the beginning. And so I ask this question, if we have been created by this amazing creator, by his will and for his pleasure, and in order to have a relationship with us, why do we struggle so much accepting ourselves? Why, why do we question our worth? Are we valid? Are we valuable in any way? Why do we question that? Well, there's an interesting character in the Old Testament, and he seemed to struggle with this very same thing. I wanted to talk a little bit this morning about Moses. Now Moses is being asked by God to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt where they were under slavery and uh, God had promised them a land of their very own and he wanted to free them and to take them to their own land. And he looked down and he decided that Moses would be the right one to lead his children out of Egypt to the promised land. But Moses is feeling very, very insecure, and he's doubting his abilities to do that. That story is found in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4, and I'm not going to take the time this morning to read it all, but I have taken excerpts of it, and I want to read it to you, and it will give you an idea of the conversation that God and Moses had about this. I'm reading from the International Standard Version. It's a little bit more of a conversational story type uh, version. And let me read it for you, starting at chapter 3, verse 7. 
the Lord said, I have certainly seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry caused by their slave masters. I really do understand their pain, so I have come down to deliver them. And so he talks to Moses, and in verse 10 he said, So go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. Bring my people, the Israelis, out of Egypt. Verse 11, but Moses told God, who am I? How, how can I go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelis out of Egypt? Verse 12, then God said, oh, I will certainly be with you. In verse 13, Moses told God, look, when I go to the Israelis and tell them the God of your ancestors sent me to you, they'll say to me, what's his name? What should I tell them? God replied to Moses, I am who I am. And then said, tell, tell the Israelis, I am sent me to you. Into chapter 4, verse 1, then Moses answered, look, they won't believe me and they won't listen to me. Instead, they will say, God didn't appear to you. Well, at this point, God realizes that he needs to give some indication of his power to Moses. And so he asked Moses to do a few interesting things. First of all, he said, what is in your hand? And, and uh, Moses said, well, this is my staff. And God said, well, throw it on the ground, which he did. And immediately it became a snake. And then God asked Moses, now you pick that snake up by the tail, which Moses did. And immediately it was returned to its original state of a staff. And then God asks Moses to put his hand inside his cloak, and when he pulls it out, he sees it's covered with leprosy. And then God says, put it back inside your cloak. And when he pulls it out again, his hand is clean. And then he says to Mo, God says to Moses, if they still will not believe you, then you take water from the Nile River, and I will turn it to blood. And so God showed these miracles to Moses. And yet in verse 10, we read, Then Moses told the Lord, Please, Lord, I am not eloquent. I never was in the past, nor am I now since you spoke to your servant. In fact, I talk too slowly. I have a speech impediment. And in verse 11, I think God is getting just a little frustrated with Moses. And he says to him, Who gives a person a mouth? Who makes him unable to speak, or deaf, or able to see, or blind, or lame? Is it not I, the Lord? Now go, I myself will help you with your speech, and I'll teach you what you are to say. But Moses was still absolutely overwhelmed with doubt and self-doubt and fear. And in verse 13, Moses said, Please, Lord, send somebody else. I think we see here a classic example of a man who's really questioning his abilities and himself because we often tie our abilities to our sense of self-worth and the two get very intertwined and so if we feel that we cannot do something then we feel that we are not worthwhile we're, we're not very valuable i'm sure you've heard the phrase believe in yourself or, or perhaps something like, uh, you can accomplish anything you set your mind to do. Or improve your self-esteem and then you're going to feel so good about yourself. And on and on and on these cliches go. You go to the library, to a bookstore, and, and you will find many books on this topic. The pop psychology of the talk show hosts that, that say these kind of things. And perhaps even sometimes in a therapist's office. I came across this quote. Your chances of success in any undertaking can always be measured by your belief in yourself. And when I read that, I, I stopped. I couldn't believe it. Really? Any chance of success in my life is measured by the amount that I believe in myself? I don't know. Can we really feel better about who we are by looking at who we are? Do we build our self-esteem by believing in ourselves? Can the person that I am struggling to believe in, which is myself, tell me, myself, how valuable I am? It just all seems so incredibly self-centered. I thought of it like going to an empty well 
and lowering your bucket and hoping that it will fill up with water. There's got to be a better way to understand our worth and value than just by looking at inside of ourselves and believing in ourselves. Could I suggest that perhaps we're focusing on the wrong thing here? As long as we keep the emphasis on ourselves, instead of including God in this discussion, we're going to take small comfort from a discussion on self-esteem and being fearfully and wonderfully created. As long as we keep focusing on ourselves, we're going to keep struggling with our self-esteem. Let's go back to the story of Moses for a minute. I find it interesting that God never says to Moses, Oh, Moses, you can do it. You can do it. You have to believe in yourself, Moses. Then you'll be able to lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. Or, oh, Moses, I know you're strong. I know you're strong. You do have abilities, Moses. You can speak. They will believe you. Not once does God say anything like that. What does God say instead? He chides Moses for not believing in him. And time and time again, we hear God saying something to, something to the effect, Moses, I will do it. Tell them about me. Moses, I will be with you. Trust me. Don't trust in yourself. You see, God chides Moses for his lack of faith not for his lack of self-worth or his lack of confidence in his own abilities or for his lack of self-esteem, God kept confirming over and over and over again the power would come from him. The power was in him. It wasn't in the ability of Moses. I think that our struggle with self-esteem should only bring a greater recognition of the greatness of God and his power that can help us to be and do all that he wants us to be and do. So in other words, if we are struggling from a lack of self-esteem or self-worth, that should be like a red light indicator that we have got our focus too much on ourselves and not enough on God. And so I would like to suggest that we do not struggle from a lack of self-esteem. We struggle from a lack of God esteem. We struggle from a lack of the value and the worth and the significance and the awe of God. We've lost that sense of awe in our creator. We have lost, we have stepped away, really. We have stepped away from recognizing who God is and depending completely on ourselves. And too often we turn that focus on ourselves and forget that God should be our focus. And we begin to value the created more than the creator. And we begin to search within ourselves for the answers of self-worth, which is the wrong place to look because God is calling us to look to him, to our creator, to discover our sense of worth. And so today, I am calling you to stand in awe of our Creator. Let me read a few verses. Psalm 33, 8. Let everyone in the world fear the Lord, and let everyone stand in awe of Him. Exodus 15, 13. Who is like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders. And Hebrews 12, 28, therefore let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken, and thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe. I love the ocean. I think that I was created to live by a large body of water, but unfortunately, I live in Stonewall, Manitoba, where the only body of water is a man-made lake that they fill up in the spring and they empty every fall, and we swim in it during the summer. But I have had the privilege of visiting several oceans around the world, and uh, a few uh, years ago, we went to the southeast coast of the United States, 
and we visited um, a chain of barrier islands that run across or alongside the North Carolina coast. They're called the Outer Banks, and I just fell in love with them. They were wonderful. And I remember one day standing on the sandy shore of the Atlantic Ocean and looking out across that phenomenal body of water. It was just a few weeks after the devastation of Hurricane Florence had gone through. We could still see evidence of, of the disaster that had, had uh, occurred on the Outer Banks as well as the coastline and in, in uh, land as well. But I was filled with awe as I stood there looking at this body of water. I thought, I'm standing here in North America, and this body of water reaches across to another continent. And this ocean goes down five miles deep. I can't imagine how deep that is. It's teeming with all kind of marine life that many, I'm sure, that never have been identified. I thought of all the lives that the storms had taken on this ocean. And I stood at this body of water in awe of it. And do you know how it made me feel? Well, I have to admit that I felt pretty small, kind of insignificant and helpless and, and almost trivial. And yet right on the heels of those thoughts came an awe and an admiration of the God who had created that ocean. And the fact that he created me and he knows me and he loves me to the point that he would give his one and only son to die for me so that I could have a relationship with him. And do you know what that did? It gave me an incredible sense of value and worthiness and relevance. Nothing that I had done, nothing that I could do, but only what God had done and only what God could do in me and through me. You see, a sense of awe of God turns our thoughts from us to the one who formed us. It gives us an understanding both of our insignificance within creation, but also our significance to our creator. Awe brings a sense of self-forgetfulness because we are emphasizing our creator and so it readjusts our identity to who we are, from who we are to who God is. And let me assure you, when you have the correct respect of God, then you will have the correct respect of yourself. It's not me who gives me a sense of worth. It's God who gives me a sense of worth. And so today, I am calling you back to a profound sense of the amazing God who created you and gives you value and worth and purpose. May he be the most important focus of your life today and always.
Thank you so much for joining us today. I truly hope you have a wonderful Mother's Day, and I would like to leave this verse with you as I go. Found in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 9. Paul is writing this, and he said, God said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. And so Paul says, Well, therefore I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. May the power of Christ rest upon you today, knowing that his grace is sufficient for you. God bless you, and thank you.